Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to BBA's inaugural journal club. And my name is Dr. Nakvi. I am the editor in chief of the Journal of the British Blockchain Association. Now, it is a, a fact that we are overwhelmed with information, mostly unverified, mostly opinions, forecasts that are presented without evidence. And that's why it is extremely important to develop this um, valuable skill of what we call a critical appraisal to differentiate uh, sound evidence, robust evidence from uh, weak evidence. And where do we uh, learn these skills? So at scientific uh, clubs like this one, and there are other venues. So why journal club? Now journal clubs have been around in most other disciplines for more than 150 years. First started in the uh, 18, 1850s by Sir James Paget, who was a British physician in a small uh, shop just by the hospital where he would um, invite uh, scholars to, uh, uh, to sit and read the general articles and appraise papers. And the, the importance of uh, developing a critical appraisal skill is that someday you might get called to testify or give any statement uh, or give an evidence in front of uh, a government committee on blockchain or crypto, and you must be prepared to structure your arguments uh, on a robust, rigorous evidence. Christopher Hitchens once said that what can be asserted without evidence can also be dismissed without evidence, which implies that uh, burden of proof regarding the truthfulness of a claim um, uh, lies with the, with the one who makes the claim. And if this burden is not met, then the claim is unfounded and the opponents need not argue further to dismiss it. So it's a very, very important point that uh, if you're making a, an opinion to make a statement, uh, you have uh, robust evidence. So in today's journal club, so this is our first journal club. We have been um, planning to launch this for quite some time. So I'm very glad that we have uh, launched this today. This is our inaugural meeting. And we will discuss three papers today. What is uh, unique about uh, this uh, uh, papers is that the authors themselves uh, are here to present their work and to, to discuss uh, what uh, the findings of their papers, the aims and objectives, why they did the research, how they did it, um, what are the key findings, and so on. So important uh, to note that you can actually organize a general club without the original authors. You can sit and appraise and discuss any paper. Um, but today we have the authors themselves. Now these papers have already been published in the JBBA. They are open access. You can read, download, share uh, for free. They are already in the, in the public domain. And the, the whole idea is to discuss uh, papers that are relevant um, blockchain and crypto assets related, something that is of interest to um, uh, all participants, preferably recent papers, but of course uh, you, could, you could do journal club uh, and discuss any paper published any, any time in the past. You could discuss uh, Satoshi Nakamoto's Bitcoin paper. So you could discuss any paper. And the, the whole idea is that it should be of relevance to the audience. And, and then you have a hopefully a good, um, a interesting discussion. You could do these general clubs in person. You could do this online. 
the benefit of online is that people from uh, anywhere in the world can can come and participate. So um, <clears throat> I'll stop here and invite uh, our first um, speaker, who is uh, Louisa. And Louisa is going to share with us uh, her paper, the findings of her paper, and uh, uh, the key, key recommendations. So over to you, Louisa. Thank you. Hi, yeah, thanks uh, for inviting me. I'm the author of the paper, NFTs as an alternative investment, evidence from crypto banks. Um, very happy to be here, talk a bit about my research and my research journey. Um, yeah, I'm basically just gonna touch on my, my research, the journey, the lessons I learned and the key takeaways as uh, you already mentioned. Um, so let's start with the research overview. My main focus um, was to evaluate the investment performance of NFTs. And um, since I wrote that paper, I uh, did the research last year. Um, CryptoPunks was one of the biggest collections at the time, and that's why I decided to use them. Um, besides that, I wanted to assess which variables uh, determine prices, um, see if NFTs have portfolio diversification potential, and compare the investment performance of NFTs to other financial assets. Um, the method I used was uh, hedonic regression because NFTs are heterogeneous assets, like they are not like stocks or currencies, they are not all the same. They all have different uh, attributes and traits and uh, often different rarities, which makes it impossible to use the same methods um, that are used for stocks, for example, to evaluate their performance. So I used uh, hedonic regression. Um, this method is also often used in the art sector, which has a lot of similar characteristics to the the NFT sector, which, for example, is it's illiquid, often irrational, and highly volatile. Mm, to touch a bit more um, on the data and uh, the research subject, CryptoPunks is a pixel art collection, which is randomly generated. Um, has a total of 10,000. Um, there are five punk types, which um, have seven, uh, 87 attributes, and all of those attributes have different rarities. Um, the data set I uh, retrieved was um, close to 12,000 crypto funds transaction in a time period of three years. Um, yeah, and I use that then to, to conduct the head, hedonic regression analysis in order to um, create an index and see what price impact those variables have. have. Um, I listed my main findings down there, but I think it's easier to, to show them uh, with some visuals, so I'm switching over to the next slide. Here on the Left side, you can see the index, which shows you that there was a heavy increase of the value of uh, crypto funds starting at the end of 2020. Basically, like the whole crypto market and NFT market exploded in the beginning of 2021, um, which is uh, kind of crazy. Um, on the right side, you can see the return rates of like the different asset classes I investigated. And you can see that CryptoPunks had a return rate of uh, 34% with a fairly high standard deviation of 61. But overall, the sharp ratio tells you that this is still the best uh, return risk trade-off out of all of uh, the asset classes I investigated. So, this also means that 
uh, crypto funds are or like NFTs are in general um, an asset that can be considered as an alternative investment. What you can't see on this slide is the um, correlation analysis I did, but that basically showed me that there's very low correlation to any other assets, even to Ethereum, which is, is great. So you can use it to diversify your portfolio as well. On this slide, you can see some of the most valuable crypto funds, which I um, calculated based on uh, the price impact each attribute had. For example, the Beanie, you can see on the uh, CryptoPunk 344 is one of the attributes that had the highest impact on the price. Um, yeah, this is also the most valuable one based on my, my analysis. Um, yeah, um, this also meant um, that rarity of those attributes and the type of crypto of the crypto punk, for example, if it's like a male or a female or an alien, like that does have an impact on price. And the more rare an attribute is, the um, higher the price becomes. For example, the punk type alien is the most rarest one or one of the most rarest ones and has the highest impact. Uh, out of all of the punk types. Mm. Next, I want to touch a bit on my, my journey. Uh, I don't think this is a typical journey, uh, journey to publish uh, a paper, but it basically all started when I was um, starting to look for uh, a topic for my master thesis. So I first heard about NFTs in January, 2021. Um, and then in April, I was looking for a topic that I found interesting that I wanted to, to investigate for my master thesis. And I thought NFTs are an interesting subject. And um, since there was so much in the media about them, I thought it would be interesting to see if they are actually worth um, as an investment. Then in May, I started started researching um, a bit more, uh, accumulated all the data, and my university, uh, University of Law, they put me in contact with Stiliano Sapakis, which is the other author, author of this uh, paper. And he really guided the process and challenged me to, to learn a few, few new skills and uh, also critically reviewed my work. And um, yeah, I was very, very grateful to have him, have him as my supervisor and kind of a guiding light in this process, which basically went on for a couple of months um, when I finally submitted it in September, end of September. And then he asked me if I uh, wanted to publish this in the JVBA. And I was obviously excited about that. So we started summarizing. My, my thesis and my paper and uh, then submitted it to the JVBA. And that's when he kind of took over. So I didn't really uh, get to see that process as much. He updated me um, frequently, but he really uh, worked with JVBA to, to get this published. Um, the main lessons I learned is obviously a lot about research. This was the first, like my biggest research project I took on and really expanded my knowledge on financial analysis. I, for the first time I used R, like the, the statistical software, um, obviously also gained market insight due to uh, researching NFTs which is really cool because now I work on a few NFT projects, which I wouldn't have done if I wouldn't have done that research. Um, yeah, on to my last slide, the key takeaways. This is basically a first attempt on the valuation model for NFTs, which I don't think is really um, 
up to date anymore because a lot of NFTs offer utility that goes beyond being a profile picture. And yeah, NFTs just have evolved so much in the last six, seven months that there's probably new valuation models needed. But it's a good starting point for, for profile picture collections like uh, CryptoPunks. And there's a lot to learn from this, I think. And it showed that uh, NFTs can be an investment that is used for portfolio diversification, even, um, even though it's a highly volatile and irrational market. Yeah, that's basically it. Um, thank you for listening and I hope you learned something new. Yeah, thank you. Um, this was fascinating. Thank you, excellent. Um, I had a question about the the attribute, um, what makes it uh, CryptoPunk uh, and NFT rare, uh, because they are all unique in a way. Um, so uh, what, what exactly it is that helps us decide, okay, this is a rare NFT. Is there a, is there a science behind it? Yeah, so like, like I said, there's uh, different attributes. For example, beanie. The, the beanie only uh, occurs, I think, um, in all transactions, uh, only 70 NFTs that were like traded had the attribute beanie. And all of the, like all of the crypto funds that were made, you know, which have a beanie, which makes it rare. So what is Dini, sorry? Like a hat, basically. Oh, okay. Okay, got yeah. it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Ah, yeah. interesting. This hat. This hat. Like it's, it's, most people find it funny, but like in the end, people are paying money for it, right? <laughs> so it's this is a very, very rare attribute. And some crypto points like this one, they don't have any attributes. So what I did, I mm -hmm. calculated the price impact of each attribute. For example, what price impact does Beanie, like uh, the Beanie have? Like, how does that affect the transact uh, the, the price of the transaction? Yeah. Uh, and then like I uh, basically um, added all those uh, price impact, like all of, yeah, all of the um, price impact together. And then with that, I calculated the most valuable crypto funds. I have the uh, exact. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Excellent. Yeah. yeah, got it. Got it. Okay. Very good. So that was Louisa Shah from University of Law uh, presenting her research on uh, non fungible tokens. Next, we have Oit Sebao um, Ekopi who is going to, um, Luisa, you can stop sharing your slides. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that was excellent. Thank you. Very good. Very good. So, Ulrich Sevab is going to, so he's presented his, his research on um, blockchain for uh, contact tracing and pandemics. So, uh, Ulrich Sevab, over to you. You have uh, about 12 to 14 minutes. Thank you. Excellent. Great. We can't we can't see you. Is your ca camera off or? Um, hold on. Um, it says I can't stop my video. Okay. No, hang on. Okay, try now. Sure. Well, great. Yeah, working, working, working. Okay. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to those in attendance and the fellow panelists. And thank you, Dr. Nassim, for putting together this first inaugural journal and giving us the opportunity to just share more knowledge on the amazing research that has been put out over the journal. So my research looks at how blockchain has the potential to improve on current contact tracing frameworks to design a solution that could effectively track the spread of an epidemic. 
So the core of this solution is the creation of an incentive based on trust. And this forgoes the need for sensitive user data like GPS or the dissemination of any personal data at all, and ultimately removes the necessity of smartphones from contact tracing altogether. The key finding here was the realization that if contact itself could be tokenized, then this would allow contact tracing to be performed securely, anonymously, and autonomously, fully on chain by utilizing smart contracts in a permission blockchain, even in the absence of a smartphone. So we explored the use of Hyperledger frameworks in its design, with Hyperledger Fabric chosen being a base framework that implements pluggable components, and that enables the system to stream to be streamlined using only the necessary services. Um, this table here outlines the thought process behind that decision. Now we have a workflow for the proposed system showing how blockchain is used to streamline contact tracing and it forgoes smartphones by creating an additional option in stored value contactless smart cards and introducing these allows people to interact with the contact tracing solution without needing any phone whatsoever. Here we have the data flow of the proposed system, including acquisition, processing, and storage of user data to be utilized by small contracts when addressed. And on the basis of trust, national medical records, independent of government IDs, are used for authentication in this study. So COVID-19 in the UK was the impact case on used. And bearing this in mind, the NHS is suggested as the national record of choice as they already possess and manage NHS numbers today. Hence, there would be no dissemination of personal data. With this solution working with an algorithm involving small contracts to make entry and exit transactions and a query used to check the world state to um, identify presence in the blockchain, this will then automatically um, notify users that test positive to let them know they have been exposed without necessarily having their location or identity um, sacrificed. So these highlight the defining qualities of trust that are highlighted here, showing how they can be converged to form an incentive. So starting from the top, we have anonymity with data collected at nodes using the app or stored value contactless small card possessing a unique ID. And then this would serve as the public key for the distributor ledger. Presence would then be identified by positive and null values created over the transactions in the world state. Bringing these together would serve to anonymize user data, making the uh, personal data insignificant beyond the use case. Coming to autonomy, contact tracing is made autonomous by using smart contracts and blockchain, with the blockchain base running independent of any form of human interference on the back end, while the user and admin interactions only occur on the front end via the client application. This limits the need for any form of interaction once the solution has been initialized. Next, by taking advantage of decentralization and the high level of encryption of blockchain, data stored on chain is now made immutable, hence secure. Looking at transparency, full transparency is maintained in two stages. First, users' private keys are linked to a national medical record or identity number for authentication, according to the country of implementation, here being the NHS number. And secondly, that chosen institution, or the NHS in this case, would act as the regulators of the client application. With them having admin access, they would be the only party with complete access to the client application. Um, keeping it secure and creating a seamless transition between hospitals identifying cases as they would already possess and manage NHS accounts today. Looking at how this would be inclusive, our solution creates an additional option through contactless smart cards, which require no device and are not traceable. Today, contact tracing has been limited to the use of smartphones, but this has created a barrier to entry as a consequence which means that the entire population pool has never been included in an analysis for an epidemic, which has lowered its overall effectiveness, as we've seen over the last few years. And lastly, awareness. So contact tracing has the potential to create awareness and provide information on the spread and demographic of a disease. And this solution provides analytical data anonymously by interpreting network statistics from the blockchain itself using Hyperledger Caliper. 
So for example, the number of cases in an area can be determined by the number of small contracts triggered and the number of blocks generated per day would allow us to understand traffic and exposure across the region instead of having to rely on personal data being sacrificed. So the proposed system provides an additional source of both accurate and trusted epidemiological data, which are necessary to curb the spread of a disease. A modular approach was adopted with the blockchain spanning a fixed geographical region to optimize storage and performance by minimizing traffic across the network. This great diagram here illustrates this with nodes being deployed strategically across densely populated locations within an area interacting with the blockchain via the client application. In terms of why this was chosen, looking at the last two years surrounding the COVID pandemic, it really highlighted primarily that there was a lack of trust in countermeasures for epidemics today, which work to hinder their public acceptance and overall effectiveness, especially at the onset of this virus. Contact tracing as an emergency countermeasure depends heavily on user behavior and its effectiveness on public acceptance. These two features are the greatest barriers facing the implementation of contact tracing today, especially in countries that already have a general distrust in their government. While there have been successful digital contact tracing solutions by the likes of Apple and Google that use Bluetooth protocols and temporary keys to forego GPS data, these still require smartphones. So the problem of inclusivity is present and bridging that gap made it clear the potential that lied in blockchain to create a new approach to this global problem. Um, this was well true because the research and conceptualization stage lasted well over five months and I can't really speak or talk about my paper without expressing my gratitude to my co-author and final year project supervisor, Dr. John Easton primarily for his patience through with me throughout that phase because it did take a while to work out the concept. Uh, for learning points, as I deep dived into blockchain during research, it laid bare the sheer boundless potential that use cases have and can thrive with by implementing blockchain. And this was my first passion project. So it was a very strong lesson on resilience and channeling passion into solving the wider problems that society faces today. Um, lastly, extensive research into COVID-19 over the course of this study ended up fueling another passion for me specifically, which is sustainability and climate change, and looking at how these two areas have the potential to intersect going into the future. Ex submitting to the JVBA was a very welcome experience, as this was my first academic paper, so writing actually took as long as designing did. Um, global and personal circumstances aside, and having that transition from the JBVA from the very first submission, there was an open, concise, and constructive feedback giving at every single stage that not only highlighted the potential that was in the paper, but made it clear the necessary steps and areas that were necessary to be improved to bring it towards publishing. For key takeaways, I believe that cryptocurrencies and NFTs have been at the forefront of innovation in blockchain more due to the nature of market and the ensuing financial incentives, which are actually necessary to set the pace for global acceptance and create awareness around blockchain technology as a whole. And uh, now this has allowed for us to look at the next frontier, what I believe is the next frontier, where we can start to explore the boundless innovative potential for use cases that lay bare within blockchain and start to utilize that. And um, well, the ISC 22 only two weeks ago already made that very clear with the share wonder solutions that have been implementing blockchain in so many ways to solve old problems in new ways. So it's really just an honor to have been able to make a contribution towards the future. Um, thank you. So I'll now take questions. Yeah, thank you. That was great. That was a very, very good presentation. Thank and um, and um, um, yeah, uh, I think um, the, my my only question was around um so you mentioned that um the patient or the subject or the person will um, become a token and then they enter their details and uh, the name address and everything and then the the public key is um is 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 is, is, is available on the blockchain and then the person uh, will have the private key so the the whole process of 
Um, so picking up and identifying and contact tracing, is it done in like in a private permissioned kind of setup or a, or a public permissioned kind of setup? That was, I just wanted to clarify how many people will have uh, kind of, you know, access to this? Is it only the ones who are involved or, uh, or public authorities as well? Um, how, how did it work? Okay, that's a very good question. So this would be a permission blockchain using Hyperledger and Hyperledger Fabric to be specific. And the general public would only have access to the client application. So that would be independent of the blockchain itself. So this is a blockchain based solution, not entirely with the access to the blockchain itself. And the, how the back end of the blockchain solution would then only be accessible to the national record of choice. So in this case, the NHS would be the only body who needs access to the blockchain itself to be able to trigger smart okay. contracts. But then everything else would happen autonomously with the smart contracts being pre-configured to facilitate the transactions for entries and exits. So users at no point would have any interaction. So the goal was to minimize human interactions on the blockchain end as much as possible to maintain that level of trust. Okay, I see, got it. So, so not all components of the app are connected to the blockchain, but the but certain components, okay. Yes. Got it, got it, very good. Excellent presentation, well done. Well Thank done. you. So, uh, so you can stop sharing. We'll have uh, Sabino. <clears throat> Sabino, can you hear us? Uh... Yes, I can. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We can't see you, I think your camera is off. Okay. Now I'm here, yeah. can you see me? Very good. Okay, I'm gonna start sharing my screen. you have my screen? Yeah, well done. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nassim. Thanks for the British Blockchain Association as a whole for the opportunity, not only to have published my work, but also to be here and be able to present and clarify any question. And thanks for the audience, which is here on a sunny Sunday afternoon. So today, we're going to be talking about uh, my research regarding crypto governance on crypto exchanges, crypto trading platforms, which was published about two years ago at the journal. I have prepared a quick roadmap for today. We're going to be talking about what is this research about? Why have I done it? The main lessons? my experience submitting the paper for peer revision and the key takeaways for our community. So let's start about what is this research about. It's about analyzing the crypto exchanges under the very basics in terms of governance for any kind of business. Uh, and I see as basics or fundamentals informations like the company name, registry and management team, which are informations we can get at the company's house and in other jurisdictions, we have the same kind of uh, public registry, the owner's identification, number of years of activity, which is quite important when you uh dealing with uh, the possibility of scams you need to know if that company has been around for a significant amount of time and where is it located and if it has a license and to do that in a structured and scientific method i have proposed a kpi uh, aggregating those uh, questions within four groups, legal and compliance, which deals with the formalities that we have mentioned, time of activity uh, with a range from up to T three in terms of score, the jurisdiction of incorporation, which is something that we don't realize, but we 
take it for granted for every kind of business, even a simple business as a grocery store, which we use only to do uh, over the counter part of transactions. Uh, in the case of crypto exchanges, we are talking about uh, investing money, significant amounts of money, and uh, businesses that deal with billions of dollars uh, in terms of trading volume per day. And the last of it, which has the highest uh, weight, is authority regulation, a license, which has that bigger weight because it compiles most of the previous uh, items. So having that framework uh, design, uh, I have adopted a sample representing 99% of the daily trading volume as of the first day of 2020. Uh, that criterion led to a number of 78 exchanges that were assessed and analyzed under that KPI. And the fee structure was also analyzed. Having all this, that data in hands, we crossed the results and the outcome is going to be presented in the next section. So why have I done it? I have done it because I have been dealing with cryptos for I think 10 years now. And I realized that even for a non-beginner as myself, it was really hard to find that kind of information. And in many cases, amongst the leaders of the market, you simply cannot find it. And I decided to get deeper into that and to study uh, and understand a little bit more using scientific methods to uh, provide a better view of why or how does the market work within that lack of information. So the lessons, uh, after submitting all the 78 exchanges to that uh, KPI methodology, we can see that most of them are within very low scores. 10 of the 78 biggest exchanges had score zero, which means you cannot find no information whatsoever regarding the entity which is trading or dealing as an intermediary with the, your money, the investor's money. And to make it uh, more straightforward, I have uh, categorized within three ranges. Four scores up to three, it's classified as poor. Between four up to six, fair, and seven and above as good. So we can see here that 64%, almost two thirds of the sample are classified as poor. And only 15% are within the good range. If we take the market share as the denominator, that concentration towards the poor range is even sharper. We're going to be uh, talking about something between 75 and 80% within the poor range and less than 10% within the good range. When we uh, analyze the fees, we see that the trend goes uh, towards the opposite direction. At the poor range, we have an average of 20 basis points of fees charged for a taker transaction. The, the criterion to assessing the fees is a standard $10,000 uh, US dollars, sorry, uh, taker transaction. So we, we have 20 basis points here for the poor and 27 for the good which means almost 35% uh, more. And if we see here on a more detailed uh, chart, we see that we have some outliers charging 100 basis points within the, the high governance score. And it's a very well-established company, which is growing and getting more market 
since then. So <clears throat> we can see that uh, despite the fact that most of the exchanges are within the, the poor governance scores, the exchanges with better governance are able to charge higher fees. Uh, so data suggests that the market customers appreciate transparency and good governance. So now, uh, talking about the my experience submitting the paper, the first thing is what I can share is to prepare yourself to be challenged by specialists. The paper I have submitted was the paper uh, which I have presented or, or prepared for my certification in Frankfurt. It was, it has already been revealed before and I, I had a, a good grade as a student. At the moment you submit that to the academia and to specialists, you have a totally different um, kind of challenge and questioning, which is very good and helps a lot to enhance and evolve the quality of the, the, the work. Uh, even though I was being revealed by blockchain uh, specialists, uh, it's interesting to see that the same uh, material can be interpreted in very different ways for different people within the area. And in my case, I have prepared tons of numbers, spreadsheets, and uh, calculations to be able to, to answer any question regarding that. And that was just not the case. The questions were much more about logic and consistency of my arguments rather than numbers or, or data. And I, regarding the Blockchain Association, the British Blockchain Association, I can only thank for the editor, which was really supportive. And I would also like to thank the reviewers because they were very constructive. Uh, and the, the final outcome is way better than the material I had in the beginning, and I thank for the reviewers and the, the editor for that. So what I can share is don't be afraid of it. Uh, you will have a better material at the end. So now we go to the key takeaways for our community. What I see today is that after two years, uh, after uh, the conclusion of the research, the key takeaways, they remain. If we take a look, a uh, quick view at the market today amongst the top 10 exchanges, four of them still would be classified as poor uh, using the same KPI. We're talking about the leaders, the companies that deal with uh, billions of US dollars per day which you simply cannot uh, clearly uh, say or understand where are they located, who are the owners, and if they do have a license or not. But on the other hand, markets appreciate transparency even more today as institutional investors get into this market, uh, you see, companies with really good governance, uh, creating value and bringing more and more volumes uh, and more uh, users to the blockchain, the crypto uh, community, which is really good. And what I see as the final takeaway is that the combination of those two sets of data the, the fact that uh, good government companies can charge higher fees and they create value. We have as an example, the successful IPO of Coinbase is that a smart regulation will provide a good environment and will foster innovation, helping our new frontier of technology and investment to, to thrive in the future. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, I, I thank you end. very much. Yeah, thank you, Sabino. That was um, 
very good presentation excellent and a lot of data there in your research no doubt and and the governance scoring system that you've um, introduced in the paper very useful um my i don't have a question just a, just a thought I always thought about it in, in you know the decentralized exchanges you mentioned about all the challenges so many poor poor exchanges poorly governed exchanges with the lack of uh, you know um, proper identity registration people behind them and these these are these are centralized or uh, exchanges open public and we are struggling we have governance challenges so when we talk about these decentralized exchanges and decentralized organizations completely decentralized how would we kind of ensure transparency and the challenges for regulators if they want to build any such system or is that something you thought about dex dex governance i thought about it the the scope of the paper is for centralized or regular exchanges but i understand and share your concern because it's completely different if we think about uh the the regulator's perspective it's uh for sure a higher challenge if we think about the user or investors perspective it might be or not if you have a strong uh, algorithm a transparent algorithm you can have a safe and transparent environment without a formal entity beneath that but uh, definitely is a gigantic challenge to regulate the decentralized exchanges, especially in the purest form. If you have a DAO ruling it, it's really hard to, to, to regulate it. Yeah, that's right. Because then, then you're right. Then we just go back to the algorithm that is governing it. How transparent is that? Whether, yes. it, whether that algorithm is being audited, how it is presented, what is in it, so you, so you just look at the the computer science behind it and pretty much take away most of the human once it's in place then you just look at the algorithmic transparency smart contract transparency computer science transparency um and so on so that is yeah that's very useful yeah excellent uh, thank you thank you very much yeah, thank so you. so that was these were three excellent presentations we kept it a little bit uh, uh, kind of a formal in a presentation style this time uh, future we will have more kind of open discussions uh, hopefully where we will have kind of a, an interactive um, kind of more interactive type of format to have more discussion um, and hopefully we'll um, uh, uh, have more kind of um, uh, audience uh, participation as well but, but this is this is very good so excellent thank you very much these sessions are recorded and all the attendees and speakers will get certificate of uh, participation as well and we will have this on our youtube channel hopefully in a couple of weeks um so if you if you want to start these general clubs in your universities in your institutions uh, to discuss jbba papers or any journal papers then we will be very happy to support you please drop us an email wherever you are if you want to start it in your university um we'll be uh, happy to support you so thank you very much to luisa with sevabo and um, and sabino uh, and we will um uh, see you uh, at our next forum uh, hopefully thank you thank you all for your participation thank you thank you bye bye thank you take care thank you